Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, thanks for an awesome conference. And uh, it's great to be here. It's even greater to be able to um, speak here. And um, yeah, we want to talk about um, bananas for scale. Um, it's going to be about um, things we've experienced. Not all experience is immediately transferable to your worlds or your um, situations. We hope that um, some of the stuff we've been through um, is useful um, for you to, to know about. Um, we need to uh, do a little disclaimer. We are um, we're talking about um, our experience, but obviously all the examples or screenshots or names you may see are completely fictitious and have got nothing to do with any living or dead people. Yeah, and I'm, I'm talking here on my own personal behalf, not for any companies that I may or may not be working for. I think as we've seen so far in previous talks, um, scaling incorporates many things. Um, many disciplines, things about team structure or um, culture, the organization um, plays a big role, which hardware you choose. Actually, for me personally, one of the, the most um, exciting talks was at the very first um, ScaleConf, um, where I don't remember who it was, but he basically explained how to buy hardware. And at that point, my thing was, well, buying hardware, what's the point? I just go to hardware store and pick a PC, sort of, or I just put stuff onto EC2. But he opened my eyes to understand that this is really, really a complex topic in its own rights. So there are many um, aspects of scaling. And um, we'll just be able to cover a very small aspect of that. Um, we are um, people that deal with technology. And um, what we've been confronted with was um, looking at a transactional system with uh, massive growth and trying to keep that afloat. Um, yeah, so we'll be looking at the technical aspects of, of scaling. So actually, we only want to talk about three things. Um, if um, three months from now, um, all you remember from what, what we try to bring across today is these three items and maybe a little bit of examples around that, then I think we've done a, we've done a good job and we've reached our goal with um, speaking here today. Um, we, want, we want you to understand that um, metrics, which is about um, measuring your system, is important. Well, maybe not very new. Um, we feel the metrics we will, re we will present um, are somehow generic, um, and they might be applicable in your case as well. Um, but this might as well be wrong, so um, please do not just um, copy our approach to metrics, um, but rather understand the underlying reasons how we got there and why um, the metrics as we um, came up with them uh, why they were useful and then you can see if that is a good approach for you as well. So in a way the, the principles are more important than the actual um, implementation. Um, but the principles without the implementation are useless. Um, the next lesson, know your system, um, we've learned that um, the hard way. Um, chances are that um, you made technology choices before you're confronted with um, having to scale. Um, and these technology choices might do the job perfectly well and are lov lovely abstraction, ex um, abstraction, abstractions, um, making it unnecessary for you to worry um, about certain aspects of your system. Um, imagine, um, for example, things like um, message queues, and, and we'll look at them a bit later. Um, they work perfectly well um, if, you, if you've chosen a big framework. Um, that incorporates uh, these queues or that implements these queues for you, but then you do reach a certain, a certain limit and then starts, uh, things start to break. Um, and now the advantage originally of having chosen a framework that does it all for you turns into a big disadvantage because you saved learning in the first place, but now you have to learn the intricate details of your framework. Otherwise, you'll not be able to, um, to, to weather those storms. Um, and 
what we've experienced is that if these tools were provided by some vendors um, that might have told you that big scale is not a problem, then at the time, those salespeople that sold it to you in the first place, um, they might struggle finding anyone who knows this particular aspect of your scaling problem right now better than you know already. So you should really know your system. Um, the, third, the third lesson is a, is a very simple one. It's a very simple principle. Um, if you change one thing at a time only, it's easy to attribute the effects to a cause, namely the single thing you changed. Unfortunately, we tend to break this simple rule. Um, if, as a result of listening to our story, only one of you resists the temptation to change multiple things at a time, then we've achieved, achieved something. So I'm quoting now. Um, a banana added for scale or used as a system of measurement is so much easier and less snobby than inches, feet, or even the metric system. <clears throat> that is a quote of the guy who contributed the, the first, uh, the title slide. Um, so why, why metrics? Um, well, what is it actually that matters? Um, Fundamentally, okay, we want to be happy, we want um, happy customers, um, we want happy stakeholders, and with a big system, there are many stakeholders, um, and they've got many different expectations, but the one thing that brings that all together is actually the system we're looking at, and it's a, in our case, and in many cases, it's a complex system, and, well, um, complex systems are complex, um, so what they do under load is they struggle, they become slow, or they break. And that results in unhappiness. So the link between our metrics and, um, yeah, well, we want, to, we want to get the metrics right because we don't want um, things to be broken and we don't want people make weight. We, want, we don't, don't want them to wait. So, is anybody waiting? How do we, how do we know? Um, we want metrics for that. Um, who is using metrics for their system? Um, it's disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> well, and some of you are actually quite, quite hesitant. Either yes or no, but yeah, okay. Um, so, I actually guess most systems have, well, I believe most systems have metrics somehow, somewhere. And we can have a first look. We can have a look at log files. There are potentially metrics in there. So if you think you don't have metrics, maybe look at your log files. Let's look at log files. Looks okay, familiar. Let's, let's uh, pause this a bit. Okay, apparently we can we can post something to buy bananas, get a 200, which might be an HTTP return code, and hey, there's a metric, 188.245 milliseconds. There's another one. And there are many. Some some requests apparently are fast, some are slower. Oh, and some funny things. What's that? Oh, some random failure. So, there is a metric already. It's about the response time. But getting to an understanding of what the system is doing by looking at this screen is not very useful for very long. So, but we can do a, a slight improvement on this, and that's Instead of just, so we can already guess where the average might lie with the response times. Um, but what we can do is we can actually also determine the average. No, but if you're, a, if you're a real developer, you've, you've developed like a shutter system in your eye, so you can like stop those images and figure out what's going on there already. So let's actually look at um, where this log file is coming from. So 
here's our application, the server. If you send it a post, then what happens? Maybe sell bananas, which takes time and sometimes fails. Um, let's get averages in. All we need to do to get the average is we need to sum the request count and we need to sum the response times. And then when we go to a particular route and we want to see what are these values right now, we just send a little bit of data back with the average response time in millis, which is just response time sum divided by request count and to make it easier, the whole request count as well. Let's see how that, what that looks like. So what we're getting now is 180 milliseconds is the average response time and the request count so far has been 725. We do it again, it's 944 requests and so on. Hmm. So we learned something now but is that enough? Um, the last restart of the server, 100,000 seconds roughly ago, we received over a million requests and the average a request took is 863 milliseconds. How useful is that statement? Not at all. It could be that in the last two minutes, not a single request went through successfully. All of them took two minutes. So we need recency. I don't think the um, Oxford Dictionary has recency in it, but I think everybody understands what is meant by it. I'm a foreigner, a non-native speaker, so. Um, yeah, so just the average, the problem with the average illustrated in numbers, a thousand requests, 980 of them could have been fantastic, but um, 20 of them took eight seconds. So, um, Well, that actually means even if we have recency in the average, so a good example of where recency is implemented, a lot of you probably know the system load on a, on a Unix-like system, and there you get the one minute average and the five minute average and the 15 minute average. So that's kind of the recency we, we would like to get. Um, but even if we have that, so these thousand requests might have been the requests in the last minute, it could still be that some of these requests are actually served very poorly. So that is why we need percentiles. Now, what are percentiles? Imagine you're in a crowd of people. These are 20 people. And you are the fourth from, you, 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 you sort yourselves by body height. And you're the fourth from the right. Then you are the 80th percentile. So if we transfer this to response times, we could say, for example, if, um, um, if the 99th percentile is 900 milliseconds, then 99% of requests are responded with in 900 milliseconds or less. And the remaining 1%, that is then candidates for potential problems. So now I'd love to go back to the code and quickly code recency and um, percentiles, but that's now not that simple anymore. Um, there are various techniques that can be used to, to get there. Um, these are just two of the, of the highlights. Um, reservoir sampling um, allows us to uh, monitor metrics without recording every single one of them, um, because that would create its own data problem in a transaction processing system. Um, and the second one, forward decaying priority sampling, um, that allows us to implement recency. We don't want to and we don't have to implement this ourselves. Um, smart people have done it for us. Um, there's Coda Hale. I think he was supposed to be here two years ago, but then was sick. Um, he did a fantastic talk called Metrics, Mic metrics Everywhere, where he explains the whole reasoning behind these metrics in a lot more detail. 
So, oh, let's actually look at that. So we now have the metrics library. We instantiate a timer. The timer gets a name, bananas. And on every request, we now record the start time. And when the request is finished, we update the timer with the time it has actually taken. Now let's see what we get. Here's our timer, bananas. We get now what is called a histogram. <coughs> the histogram now gives us the percentiles. We here get a 75th percentile, 95th percentile, 99th, and a 99.9th percentile. And so the 95th percentile says 689 milliseconds. So 5% of our requests are slower than that, are responded in a longer time. And then we get um, the um, request rate, the one minute average, the five minute average, and the 15 minute average. And um, as the request rate here is pretty constant, these look relatively similar. So what? <clears throat> now we can compare. What do we want to compare? A transaction processing system is typically not always under the same load. So sometimes it's almost idle, and other times it's flying really fast, or it should be flying really fast. <clears throat> so what we get in our transaction processing system is a curve that looks like this when we draw the request rate. So to over a 24-hour period, the request rate dur during the night is very low, almost down to zero. Then in the morning, people transact a lot, then around lunchtime, <clears throat> and maybe there is a nap, there's not so much happening. And in the afternoon, the majority of the transactions are happening. So if we now look at, if we now observe the response times, and obviously we don't just have a one endpoint by bananas, we maybe have a few more. Um, then we can start analyzing what is really happening and we can compare um, between the morning and the afternoon and between this week and last week and between this week and last month, etc. Well, do we really know our metrics by now? It's a very contrived, simplified example, but I think that type of principle applied to the various parts of your system, that might be a decent approach to um, yeah, getting meaningful metrics out of your system. So, let me just adjust this. For those of you who have never come up here, there are some perks to this. There's a bottle of Jack Daniels here, so I'll take a swig of that. You know, that's because you're not laughing enough, and I'm starting to feel a little bit nervous. Okay, so. Um, for this part of our talk, um, we thought it would be quite important to, for you to understand that an application running on your own machine uh, while you're developing it behaves quite differently when you let it loose in, in the production world. And what we found is that applica applications tend to get quite grumpy when they're under load and when you start poking them to go faster. So, for example, in a, in a, in a quite a large transaction processing system, there are tons of things that you can go, can go change. The connection queues, Thread pools, TCP IP stack stuff, camel thread pools, JDBC connection pools, message driven pool sizes, bean caches, Hibernate caches, client pool sizes, stuff in the message broker, database magic, because they're like, there's like a whole different world out there. Um, the heap sizes, stuff about the garbage collection, and the JVM flags. So as you can see, lots of things um, they can go fiddle with. But, you know, what we, what we found out the hard way is that um, fiddling with these things without understanding what's going on in your application kind of can get you sucked into trouble. So, um, 
So this part of the talk, we've taken some examples from um, a large system, or let's try to say large systems at different clients <laughs> that um, is built on, on, on a legacy language. So who's still using Java here? Oh, cool. So this, this talk is especially for you guys. But still using Java to make you feel welcome. I know there's a few guys here in front that are, that are feeling, um, I don't know, they haven't put up their hands because I, th I suppose they're feeling ashamed of their career choice or something. <laughs> Anyways, so let's move along. So in a way, this is also, it's a therapy session for me to kind of work through the things that I, that I can't unsee anymore. So I hope by, by sharing it with you guys, I'll feel a little bit better. So my first example what we realized is that if you have a large system running at a client and you don't have monitoring installed at the client, it's, it's a little bit like driving along on the highway and you've got a single instrument in your car, one red light. And if the red light goes on, it means that either you've crashed or you're speeding or you've stopped or maybe the lights are on or you've got the flickers on or whatever. So it doesn't help a lot. So we, we try to get all our clients to install monitoring. Now, that's usually a good thing, but at one client we had a, a very enthusiastic person that went and enabled all the monitoring on, on Glassfish. Now let me set it to low, which should be fine, shouldn't it? Well, it wasn't. So the system kind of became very, very slow. And after a lot of looking around and staring at thread dumps, which is my main thing in life, I, I can read thousands of thread dumps in, in a very short time. So if you want some thread dumps analyzed, I can do it for you. Um, we found this one example of a lot of threads. Okay, a lot of threads. Anything that had anything to do with transactions, which is a lot of threads in a transaction processing system, they're all stuck looking like this. And that's kind of dodgy. And one thread had the lock and was scanning through a vector. And that vector was actually a list of transactions that were processed. So as it was completing the transactions, it would go off and it would tick them off and say, OK, I want to take them out and then I want to update some kind of metric. So essentially, by switching on the monitoring on low, we made the application server go, Ooh, nothing much more happened. And that was basically the end of it. Now, this is one of the funnest part of my job, is to actually then phone somebody or, or make a, a comment on a ticket and say, you can fix your system by just making low and setting it to off. You don't even have to restart anything. So, and what we, what we learned from this is that, um, as, as Chris said earlier, with big systems like an application server or big frameworks, all that complexity and functionality comes with a price. Because what you're building on is not something that you may understand. So you may think that setting something like the monitoring to low is actually quite okay. But in this case, it wasn't okay. And like one of my friends who's also here today, he's, he's building a, a plane at home, which I hope he'll test first before I fly with him. Um, he explained to me that there's a big difference between um, countersunk rivets and normal rivets on the plane, because at high speeds, the, the, the actual wind resistance of those rivets have a big difference. So in a way, this, is, this illustrates that point quite nicely. On a system that was running along at a few transactions a second, you wouldn't even have noticed this. So at another vicious client, um, we got like this very disturbing issue log that said that they are seeing ever-increasing database constraints in the log files, primary key constraints. Now that's usually something that worries me. I don't know about you guys. But this is, um, in, in our case, we were using, because it's a whole big Java stack, it's using JPA, JPA is using Hibernate, Hibernate is using sequences. So it shouldn't be possible for a database to have primary key violations. Hence we were quite worried about this, so we started digging into this. But before we get to what the solution was, let's have a look at a little bit of look about integers. And you may kind of figure out where this is going to end. It's going to end with tears and embarrassment. <laughs> so the maximum value of an integer is just over 2 billion, which normally sounds quite large. So 
And if you were to go and use that integers for um, primary keys or IDs, and you were trundling along happily at about 10 transactions a second, one integer every um, second, that'll last you just a little bit short of seven years, which is already a bit of a problem. But if you were to run it a little bit faster, that'll only last you 124 days, which is not very, a very short time in the life of any system out there. And in Java, if you were to go and increment an integer beyond its maximum, what'll happen? It'll wrap around in the negative. So you can kind of guess what happened here is we had a third party um, library from JBoss that we were using and it was using integers for its IDs and for the database columns. And as it was going along, it was using a single, single sequence on the different tables. And so it was spraying all the IDs across the different tables. It wrapped around into negative. Nobody knows there's anything because it's still working happily. And then when it wrapped around again, the second time it went into positive, then suddenly we started seeing all these random um, constraint violations in our logs. So to our defense, we did do a proper evaluation of all the frameworks, but we didn't actually look at the code. And that's maybe the lesson that one can learn from this. It's just like, if you want to use a framework as a kind of central part of your transaction processing system, I think you've got to do a lot of work and make sure that it actually works quite well. And then lastly, maybe it's better to use a long. It's, um, I think that's 9.2 quintillion, if I've got it right. And at 200 transactions a second, it'll last about one and a half billion years, which is fine by me. I won't be around for that to crash then. <laughs> okay, so this is a favorite of mine, garbage collection in Java or any other system out there in the world. Most of them nowadays are using garbage collection, even if you don't think they're using it. So I just wanted to check who here has tried to um, tune garbage collection. Okay, keep those hands up. <laughs> uh, who have you actually made it better? Hmm. I was going to, yeah, I see, now they get quite, uh, <laughs> quite, a, quite a few less. Uh, and how did you actually know that it was better? So, I think garbage collection is one of those things that are, that, that are looking so, you're quite naive in the beginning. You're thinking, hmm, this looks like something that I can make faster. Let, let's use that parallel thing and plus, instead of using the, the CMS thing or whatever, fiddle with this, fiddle with that. In the end, it's just a lot of tears. So usually when you, when you see garbage collection issues somewhere, you'll see all these odd little pauses in your application's performance. If you, have a, if you have a heap that's too small, you'll see very frequent short collections. And you know, obviously people don't like all these short little pauses, so they fix it. They have a huge heap. And then every now and then they have like a stop the world monster collection. And if it was maybe used in a medical piece of equipment, <laughs> I wouldn't want to lie there on a, on, a, on a theater table one day and then look up at the monitor and then see like a little exception going past there. I'll probably, <laughs> probably get up and go right at that stage. So, And imagine then even worse, you oversubscribed your system's memory. And now as you're doing this stop the world garbage collection and it's going through all the memory, it realizes, oh wait, that piece of memory is actually on the disk somewhere and it starts swapping to disk at the same time. So life really becomes bad at this stage. Things to, oh, what is that again? So kind of important to understand what your applications memory patterns are because you, you in real life you may actually not be able to fix it with garbage collection you might actually have to go and fiddle with the application to to make it better i have verbers garbage collection switched on to see what's going on there regularly analyze it and unlike many other things that you will see on tv this is something that you do need to try at home where nobody can get, get hurt and then later on implied introduction okay so what can you learn from this picture it's very hard to find anything on virtualization on um, Google Images. <laughs> so earlier, Chris um, mentioned the, the Linux average metrics that 
that you can get on, a, on an unbox by running uptime or whatever. So for the, the people that don't understand this, um, the three numbers at the back there explains to you how many processes were running and waiting for CPUs in the last minute, the last five minutes, and the last 15 minutes. But it's completely oblivious about the number of process, processors that are in your machine. So if, you've, if your machine has got a single processor, this would have meant that your machine was quite busy in the last minute, five minutes, and the last 15 minutes. Whereas if it had like four CPUs, it would have been kind of okay. But what does this mean now if you are using some kind of virtualization technology such as VMware and it's a virtual CPU? Does it still make sense to look at this number? And then my favorite. I mean, so you're looking at a, at a, at a five-minute average number of processes that were waiting for a CPU, but the CPUs were, were scaled dynamically up and down in that time. It, it doesn't actually mean a lot to look at these numbers and to try and deduce what your system is doing if you're using a virtualization technology that you don't quite understand how it works. So the, the lesson from this is very short and sweet. And, and this is something also that we learned at some of our clients. If they're using, doing odd things on their systems and they're doing, using Solaris containers in ways that you haven't anticipated, then you can't make any deductions about your system by looking at these values. So better make quite sure that you understand what's going on on a production system. So back to a real life example. Um, here we had a system that was running along happily one day and snailing along the next day. And that's usually a signal to me that you know, something, something changed. Somebody, somebody made a change somewhere, although I may be vehemently denying it. Um, so we investigated all the normal culprits and after trawling through hundreds more thread dumps and log files and wonderful things like that, we found this. So for those of you who don't know Glassfish, Glassfish keeps a transaction log and where it records all the transactions that are in flight uh, so that it can recover from a crash later on. And it was writing these transactions to a journal on a disk that was also used by the false, by the application to write log messages. And our client, they were trying to solve another issue. They had the, the system running on high, high logging level and this is all going to the same disk. And the lesson that we learned from this is that um, systems can share resources in surprising ways, in, th in ways that you can't th think of. So the, the solution was just to move the log files to an, a different disk. Okay, so this time, you know, it's one of those times where the, the call is logged, somebody starts touching to you on Skype, a phone call comes in, the boss arrives into office. All of them happen at the same time because the system had just abruptly stopped. So we trawled through a few hundred more thread arms and looked at many more log files, stared at the monitoring stuff, and we found this. So it appeared that the system had run out of file handles. So we um, realized that... Look at the second line, not the one in yellow. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Uh, I moved that after we made the presentation. <laughs> so the, the, it was a Java virtual machine. It is using a, something called local attach. And we had a, a little monitoring application running on the same box that was regularly connecting to the breaker and all the other JVMs on that box to check the JMX metrics. And somehow, by miracle, we had triggered an obscure bug in the JVM that, you, that ate up all the file handles by virtue of the, the, the JVM that kept on running there. Um, and we actually broke the transaction processing system with our small little metrics collecting um, application. And the lesson that we learned from this was that you have to really psych test all parts of your application, even the little thing that just sits in the corner there um, collecting the metrics for you. Well, don't measure your metrics would be the, long, the wrong lesson. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so this is a really quirky example that I'm just going to quickly run through. Um, usually with a message queue, such as this, um, you measure the number of messages in the queue, and then the, the number of messages kind of tells you how many messages are waiting to be processed, plus the, the few that are being processed right at the front here. <laughs> um, 
And we had a very strange problem where we would see that messages are sitting on the queue, but not all the consumers would be busy, which would be kind of curious, you know, because you know, there are still consumers open at the frontier, literally, but nothing's moving. So this had, had us um, flummoxed for a while until we realized that for this particular um, broker that we were using, you can set up something called a, a three-fetch um, message count. And this is the number of messages that will be pre-delivered from the queue to different consumers. And those consumers then have like little local queues next to them. But it still looks as if those messages are on the queue. And in this particular case, the front message in each of those little local queues were poisonous. Obviously, the, the consumer was a little bit stupid and it didn't know what to do with it and it was just hung. Um, and hence, this just looked like the whole system was not actually processing messages, although it was actually just the messages in front of the, the little local queues. It's a bit like standing at a grocery store and there's still tellers open and you're in your little short queue, but the guy in front is paying some kind of bill that doesn't want to go through. It's a little bit like that. And the, the lesson that we learned from this was that you have to really look at the configuration options for every little piece of software that you're using. Maybe have a look at the, the bottom view that you don't often see, and then try and figure out, you know, look at the documentation, are those things important or not? So, cheap tools. So you would have seen us using a lot of thread dumps and things here, and what we found is that Thread arms are really like the poor man's production profiler because often, often you'd get to a client and they won't have all the nice monitoring software on site and then having them do a few thread arms can be worth quite a lot of um, yeah, money, literally, for us. Print the garbage collection stats. It's obviously, obviously quite useful to try and analyze. You do get quite nice tools nowadays, some of them commercial like Sensum, which is very nice to use. Um, this is something that I found was quite useful. So instead of waiting until your system has actually died, have a look while it's running during a busy time and check out those thread arms and what's going on inside the logs because a lot of times you can actually fix those issues before they become issues. And then a, a last little thing that you can maybe just think about is what about recording all the transactions that are coming into your system and then later on replaying the five busiest minutes of the week over a weekend somewhere when nobody can get hurt as well. And that's kind of what the Navi system was about. Yeah, we have just a few minutes left, um, but it's also a very simple lesson. Change one thing at a time, right? So the simple rule we broke, um, well, the detail may not be that important. The bean pool is at its limits under load. Let's double it. It will certainly reduce response times in the average. Sounds right? Yeah, and myself, since I like fiddling with garbage collection, thought, okay, maybe I can just add a few more garbage collection threads. And it looks like there's enough CPU, so it certainly can't hurt. It'll just make things faster. Well, so what do we do? Um, we make the changes together. We've got no time to lose. We have only one maintenance window per day or per night. So, yeah, let's go. Let's do it. Sadly. Well... All we can do is an emergency rollback. Um, things got really, really bad. Um, but the really tragic thing is, because we changed two things at the same time, we are now as smart as before. It could still be that one of the two changes alone might have actually been a good change into the right direction. It might have helped the system to recover nicely. But because we did both changes at the same time, we simply don't know. Yeah. Right? Losing a day. Yeah, sadly, this happens quite a lot when there's a lot of pressure, a lot of people hanging around your desk when you kind of try and make many things work at the same time. And, yeah, so just to summarize, cause and effect are often not what you expect. Oh, sorry, you're still reading. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's the three, the three lessons. Know your metrics. Know your system and change one thing at a time. Any questions? <laughs> Any questions for the guides? Hello. Hi, uh, Chris. So 
Um, yeah, the, the 99th percentile, you know, I'm quite glad you covered. I'm just wondering, I, I heard about coordinating omissions. Do you, uh, know, can you expand a bit on that? Coordinate the uh, omission. Uh, when you're measuring latency, like in order to not, you, you shouldn't be dropping packets um, when you when you sampling. I just don't know if yeah, that's made any sense, or do you know anything about that? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, I'm afraid I don't. <laughs> I, don't I don't know what you're okay. referring to. Sorry. So, so from what I understand, so if you're doing a simple ping test, for instance, can everybody hear me okay? Um, normally you ping like 100 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds apart, but when, you, when you're busy sampling, uh, you, you can have one ping that's 10 seconds apart, but then you're only measuring that single ping that was 10 seconds, and all the rest are fine. And so you say, oh, well, that one's very small, whatever. You know, it's, a, it's up there where we ignore it. Um, but what you should be doing is you're going, even while it's waiting for 10 seconds, you should be still pinging uh, on different threads almost and seeing, okay, well, for 50 different pings, um, it should be, it was a 10 second delay or less. So are, so yeah. are you referring to the right, the right of things that are actually happening? Yeah, so you should be, you should be checking if you do 100 or 1,000 things. Yeah, so, so that is built into the metrics. You'll see there's always the last one, five or 15 minutes as well, the, the rate of things happening. So it kind of gives you a weight as to how important the, the metrics are, what you're looking at. Because we had this, also had a client, where they would be very upset about things that were slow three o'clock in the morning, but just like one message that came through for the whole night. Uh, if that answers your question. Okay, cool. Anyone else? Not a difficult question, Armand, please. <laughs> Not a difficult, okay, let me think of another one. No, make, um, it, make it difficult. <laughs> <laughs> no, this isn't so difficult. Um, on the metric side, in your experience, is it better to kind of have a predefined idea or design for these are the bunch of metrics I want, and then figure out how you're gonna apply and get it out of the system? Or is it more something that evolves over time, you discover that, listen, this would actually be useful, this would be useful, and you add it over time. What, what kind of approach do you think you found best? Well, I would certainly prefer a more proactive approach. Like, what happened in our experience, though, is that we really came in with the whole metrics approach quite late. So, fires were burning already, and then did we have to think about uh, what metrics to put in. And um, so, I think there is a, the, the idea of measuring these two things, response times and request rates, um, that is relatively generally applicable, but I think it depends a lot on the structure of your system. So it's probably most important to, to start being very serious about these metrics at the entry points into your system. So where your mobile app speaks to the actual uh, internet-facing API, for example. But in a more complex system where you depend on other services, you depend on a database, you depend on mobile network operators, you depend on messaging systems, then it might become important to measure, using the same principles, um, very similar metrics. Because then you can say, well, the, the 99th percentile for the customers is, is bad, but the 99th percentile when looking at the, the uh, uh, messaging system is actually fine. So this is not where the problem is going to be. So that way, in a bigger system, obviously the buy banana system is, is trivially simple. Um, you can use that metrics approach almost in, a, in an outside-in fashion. Get it right for the outside first and then uh, become more granular. If that answers your not so complicated question. <laughs> So you mentioned, you asked the question about garbage collection and has anyone tried messing around with it and that it normally ends in tears. Um, would you recommend that, you know, if you had a system that was potentially slow with high transactions, to start exploring that? There's a few different algorithms that you can play with. In your opinion, where, where would, what should you try before looking at garbage collection, perhaps? Everything else. Everything else. <laughs> <laughs> No, actually, um, it's funny, funny story. I tried doing that yesterday. So we're busy with a, a performance test for somebody. 
and and I did look. Uh, I was looking at thread humps, and the thread humps were just not making a lot of sense to me. Uh, it's when you find the thread hump where this is okay. I've got 200 threads waiting for a lock, but nobody has the lock. Then it usually points towards like the, the garbage collector has maybe got it. But the best way to approach these things is to first analyze data from the garbage collection logs to make sure that it is actually an issue, and then start changing one thing at a time, and then measuring it again. Um, <coughs> you mentioned both using logs as well as um, logging metrics with the client library. Is there a conflict there? I, I'm busy investigating systems like Logstash, where you can extract um, metrics from your logs. Would you prefer to just use logs for everything, or is it better if you can design something up front to separate metrics from logs? That's a harder question. Um, I don't know. I think um, what I find most important is that before, so, so if you start crawling through your log files and then you see, oh, let's, we can define this metric, we can define this other metric, we can define yet another metric, then you end up in a, in a, in a sea of metrics uh, or in a big data problem called metrics um, and you're not seeing the forest for the trees. So I think what is first and foremost important is the approach that you really start thinking about what metrics do you really want first and then you start finding them. And then if you find the metrics by um, aggregating log files or if you find them by using a library is maybe not that important. Like, I personally would have a bit of a preference to rather use a library um, because things like this reservoir sampling, etc., that is probably a bit more lightweight in, with that approach. Well, I, th I, think, I think metrics and log files can complement each other. So metrics, both for figuring out that your clients are happy, but then to locate where issues may be in your system is quite useful. And then in the end, you'd still have to use a log file or a thread dump or something to figuring out what is actually still broken. Look at Logstash and Kibana, Elasticsearch. <coughs> 